Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Grace. You know, many people like to talk about grace. They talk about how wonderful it is, how they want the grace of God, maybe even how they enjoy the grace of God. But the reality is a lot of people don't understand it. There's misconceptions in the religious world around us. People have been misguided or mistaught about grace and really what it's all about. So we want to turn to the Word of God and examine it to see what it is that it teaches about grace, because this is the only place we're going to gain a proper understanding of it. And so we encourage you to grab your Bible, open it up, and study on this important topic, this topic that can bring great joy and a wonderful blessing into our life, but only if we have the proper understanding about grace. So to better understand grace, we want to look at three things in our study together. First of all, the characteristics of grace. There are a few characteristics that we want to look at and pull out so we have a good understanding of what it is is. But then also we want to notice how grace and works relate to one another. Because again, this is an area of great misunderstanding among the religious world around us, that people think that grace and works are opposed to one another. But we want to notice what is it that God's word says about grace and works. And then finally, we're going to answer the question, can a Christian fall from grace? So let's begin by looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, where Paul writes about grace. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So let's understand, first of all, that grace is something that's undeserved. That's why he talks about there in verse 4, God who is rich in mercy. Mercy is the idea of unmerited favor. And so God extends forgiveness to us. He extends the remission of sins to us based on grace or mercy and undeserved favor and undeserved blessing. And so we can't work to earn God's grace. We can't work and put God in our debt to extend mercy to us. But we simply depend upon his favor, his kindness, his love toward us. But let's understand, because grace is a gift, doesn't mean it's unconditional. If grace was unconditional, then all men who have ever lived would receive grace. But we know the Bible teaches that there are few who are going to go to heaven and many who are going to be lost in hell. So grace is not unconditional. It has conditions with it. And we understand that concept, how that there can be conditions on something, but meeting those conditions does not mean that you've earned it, that you've worked to put someone in your debt, in this case, God in your debt. So take, for instance, someone who leaves their child an inheritance in their will. Let's say they leave them a million dollars, but it's conditioned upon that child finishing a four-year degree and maybe reaching, let's say, the age of 25. And so if those conditions are not met, then that child will not receive the million dollars. But if they are met, that child earns that four-year degree. We understand that they're going to receive that million dollars, not because they earned it by going to school, but because they met the conditions laid out in the will. And so it is with us that there is mercy that God extends to us, and it is a gift, but 
it is not unconditional. In Titus chapter 2, Titus 2 verses 11 down through 14, Paul discusses this idea of the grace of God and certain conditions that are attached to it. In Titus 2 verse 11, he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Did you see the conditions that are in there? The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, and that's the idea that you've had the gospel that reveals the grace, so it's a gospel of grace, that that has appeared to all men. It's been given, it's been delivered, and we have it before us today, and that grace teaches us something. It teaches us that we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. You see, that's a condition. A condition of receiving God's mercy and His forgiveness, a condition of fellowship with God, is that we would deny something. We would not do certain things. And that is here, ungodliness, worldly lust, that we would not live in sin. But also, it says that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. So there are things not to do, and there are things to do. So that means submission or obedience or as we said before, is conditional. The grace of God is conditional. And if we don't meet those conditions, then we don't have the grace of God. We don't enjoy the grace of God. And again, it doesn't mean that we're earning that grace. It just simply means that we are submitting to the will of God, to the conditions that he has laid out. It's still a gift. And one other thing we want to notice just briefly before we move to our next point, and that is that Grace is not a license to sin. Some people had this concept in the first century. Some people have this concept today. They think, well, I received the grace of God, and so my life, my choices now really don't matter because I have the grace of God. And it's almost as though it's automatically going to be applied, and they don't need to worry about whether or not they're serving God, that if they sin, it's not that big a deal because they have grace. Well, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul answers this question. He deals with this issue. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, if sin is what brought grace and grace is good, then should we sin more? so we can get more grace. That's the concept or the idea that he's getting at. And his answer to that is in verse 2, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? You see, when you become a child of God and when you receive the grace of God, that's supposed to motivate you to stay away from sin, serve God diligently, faithfully, day after day. It's not something that then allows you to go and commit all the sin that you want because God's grace is there. No, when we receive his grace, it is to be that motivating factor that we would serve him because he's been so good to us, because he gave us this immeasurable gift of mercy and forgiveness and the hope of everlasting life. So grace is not a license to sin. Let's think for a moment or two about the idea of grace and works. And what's the relationship between grace and works? When we look in Romans chapter 4, we see that Paul discusses Abraham and how that he was saved by grace. In Romans 4, beginning in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So when we read that, we understand the arguments being made. Look, Abraham was saved by grace, not by works, but people read into this. Now carefully note what's 
in here and what's not in here. So this is how some people read it. For if Abraham was justified by any works, that's how some people read it, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Now let's understand him who works, verse 4, is not him who works at all, the proper understanding, him who works perfectly, because that's what it would take to put God into our debt, that we would have to work perfectly. We would have to live an absolutely perfect life, sinless, flawless, just like our Lord in every way. That's the only way that we could be saved by works. So when Paul is writing about Abraham being saved by grace, not by works here, he's not talking about the fact that Abraham did not do any type of works at all, that Abraham was not obedient to the commandments of God, that Abraham did not do something in order to please and to honor God. That's not what that's saying. And how we know that is when we jump over to James chapter 2, James uses the exact same great patriarch as an example of being saved by works. In James 2, he begins a discussion around verse 14 about works and how we need to work. But notice in verse 21, he says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Not by faith only. You know what Romans chapter 4 is saying? Romans chapter 4 is saying we are saved by faith, not by works alone. James chapter 2 is saying we're saved by works and not by faith alone. In other words, you put these two passages that are teaching on the same concepts of faith and works, and with the same exact Bible hero, Abraham, is telling us that we have to have faith and works, because there's some people who think that our works save us. There's some people who think, well, if we just do the exact right things and we just check off the boxes and God will be in our debt and he owes us his mercy. And that's not true. But there are other people who think, well, all I have to do is just believe God and there's nothing else required of me. I just need to have a mental understanding about Jesus, about love, about his sacrifice, about heaven and things like that. And they think they don't have to do anything, that they don't have to be obedient to God. But the Bible teaches both things are required. We must have faith and works in order to receive God's grace. We have to be obedient. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about these great Hebrews of faith, and it mentions a couple of different things in the life of Abraham. And remember in Hebrews 11 verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So by faith he obeyed. He submitted to the will of God. Faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So God gave a command to Abraham. Abraham submitted to that. And that is what faith is in action. That is working to do God's will. In verse 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was, te when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. See, James gives that example of Abraham offering up Isaac, and he says he was justified by works in doing that. Here it talks about Abraham doing it by faith. And people who have been taught that faith and works are opposed to each other have a hard time reconciling these. But it's faith based on the commandment of God that I'm going to do God's will in obedience to him. That's works. So, works of faith, works of obedience versus works of merit. So faith and works go together. Let's look at an example in the Ephesian church and how the Ephesians 
were recipients of God's grace, but it was through obedience. Again, we go back to Ephesians chapter 2, and remember it says there in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And some people read that and say, well, see, they didn't do anything to receive God's grace, to receive salvation. But notice again what it says, For by grace, God's part, you have been saved through faith, man's part. You see, God does his part and he expects man to do his, that is to submit to his will. So let's notice what the Ephesians did. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, In him you trusted after you heard the word of truth. So they heard the word of truth. When you go back to the book of Acts chapter 20, this is where you have the account of the Apostle Paul talking to the elders at Ephesus, and he recounts his behavior, his time among them, and what he did with them. In Acts 20, verse 32, he says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Back in verse 26, he says, therefore, or verse 25, <clears throat> and indeed, I know that you all among whom I have been preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. I've been preaching that kingdom. I've been teaching you. And you heard that word. In verse 27, he says, for I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So Paul was there teaching them and they were hearing Ephesians 1.13 says that they heard the gospel. And it says also that you trusted in him in Ephesians 1.13, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So they heard and they believed. So the hearing led to belief. The hearing led to a conviction and understanding about God, about Christ, about mercy. And so they heard and they believed. And so that's the idea of them having faith. But then also notice Acts 20, Acts 20 in verse 21. And he's telling these elders at Ephesus about his time among them, how he proclaimed the word of God, how he kept back nothing from them, testifying, Acts 20, 21, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So he taught them about repentance. When you back up to Acts 19, remember this is Paul at Ephesus in Acts 19 and verse 17, after an amazing event had happened, it says, this became known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. You see, that's a case of repentance. So Paul was preaching among the people, they heard the word, they believed that word, and they repented of their sin because repentance was part of what Paul was teaching them. But then let's notice also that these people at Ephesus, that they were baptized in Acts chapter 19, Acts 19 and Let's just read verses 1 through 5 to get the whole context here. Acts 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they heard the teaching. They believed that teaching. They turned away from their sins and they were baptized 
in the name of the Lord Jesus. This goes right along with Ephesians chapter 5. In verses 25 to 27, where Paul is talking about the husband and wife, but really it's talking about the relationship between Christ and the church. In Ephesians 5, 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Do you see that? Do you see how it's telling us that these brethren at Ephesus had been washed, they had been cleansed. It says washing of water by the word, that is through the word they were taught what they needed to do. Paul came to them. He taught the word of God. They believed that word of God. They turned away from their sins and they submitted to water baptism to have their sins washed away. And that, friends, is what it means when he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace, God's grace, God's mercy, you have been saved through faith. Remember, as we studied about Abraham, faith is belief in action. Faith is doing something because you submit to the will of God. So, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. We can't earn it. We can't put God in our debt, lest anyone should boast. So, grace and works go together. They're not opposed to each other, but they work together in us serving God and having a relationship with Him. Now, let's answer the question, can a child of God fall from grace? You know, the Bible tells us that we are saved by grace, by the gospel of grace. In fact, if we go back to Acts chapter 20, where Paul is talking to those elders at Ephesus in Acts 20, verse 24, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. You see, that gospel is what reveals the grace to us. But we have to continue in it. We can't let go of it. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You have the gospel of grace, that Paul says he preached at not only Ephesus, but at Corinth. They received it, they stood in it, and he says, you have to remain in it, you have to hold fast to it. And that's how you're going to be saved in the end. You know, if you go to Second Peter chapter 2, you see a very explicit declaration that we can have grace, and then lose that grace. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 18 beginning, he says, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if... After they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Do you see how he says they escaped the pollutions of the world? They escaped sinfulness. They were in the way of righteousness, but they turned back to sin. And the latter end is worse than the first. That is, they've gone back into sin and they're doomed again that they have lost their relationship with the Lord and lost that salvation. So they no longer enjoy the grace of God. In Galatians chapter 5, 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, it says something very similar, the same principle, the same point is being made, where he says, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. You see that? You have fallen from grace. So they had grace, and they fell away from the grace. So can a child of God fall from grace? Yes, absolutely. The Bible says you can. And that's why the Bible emphasizes to us faithfulness, steadfastness, zeal, diligence in pursuing God and doing His will and drawing close to Him. That's why it commands us to repent of our sin. If we could not fall from grace, why would we need to repent of our sin? You see, the Word of God teaches us that the grace of God is there for us to enjoy, but it's conditional, and we must obey His will. And when we receive that grace, we have the blessing of forgiveness and the hope of everlasting life, but it can be something that we fall away from, that we lose because of our choices to turn against God, to rebel against Him, to be disobedient, to live unrighteously, to live in sin, and God cannot have fellowship with sin. And so that relationship is severed when we go back into sin. So let's look at the Word of God. Let's desire the grace, but let's have a proper understanding of what that is, that we may enjoy it and be filled with hope and peace. Let's look in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 27 for a few moments. This is right after Jesus had the experience of the Mount of Transfiguration. He's come down from the mountain. He finds a situation unfolding that has generated a lot of excitement. And what we want to notice in this incident here is a father's desperation. So Mark 9, we want to read verses 14 down through 27. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. So we see here that There is a father who has brought his demon-possessed son to be healed of that demon possession, to have that demon cast out. And this young boy was in a terrible condition. He's both mute and deaf. He has these seizures that maybe we would look at and see similar to an epileptic seizure. It would convulse him, it talked about. He would foam at the mouth. He would gnash his teeth. He would become very rigid. And so... The father tells Jesus that this has been going on from childhood. And in addition to that, it said there in verse 22 that this spirit would throw the child into the fire and into the water in order to destroy him. Now, in this condition, the father had no real relationship with his son. Yes, he still took care of him daily. He kept a constant 
guard over him or a constant watch over him, but there was no real friendship there. There's no real companionship that he was able to have with his son because his son is not in his right mind. And as the father looked at this, you have to imagine that he was tortured day by day, seeing what his son was going through, seeing the consequences of this demon possession, seeing his son when he was thrown down, the bruises that he would receive, maybe cuts on his body and even burns as he is thrown into the fire. And you have to think that the father was on edge constantly worried about what would become of or what would happen to his son. So this father is a desperate father when he brings his son to the disciples at first. And then as he is talking to Jesus about his son's condition and what has happened to him. Now, a question we might ask is, how desperate would you be if you had a child in this condition Would you have a heart that was heavy, a heart that was torn day by day? Would you be obsessed with finding a cure for your son so that he would not be going through this anymore, so that that demon would be cast out and no longer have power or control on him? And how relieved would you be at his healing? You know this father, when Jesus took him up and he was free of the demon, you know this father was rejoicing. He was overwhelmed with joy. Well, how joyful would you be if your child, who was struck with such a terrible malady, was all of a sudden free of that? All of a sudden they were healthy, they were whole. Well, you would have that same great joy as well. Now, let's think about this parallel. Think about the parallel of the demon possession of this boy to how sin affects us and affects our family. You know, in Romans chapter 6, it talks about the fact that when we are in sin, we are slaves to sin. And what that really means is we're slaves to the devil. When the devil gets into us, so to speak, he takes control of us. He seizes us. Now, there is a difference between the young man in Mark chapter 9 and him being demon possessed, which was completely beyond his control, and us being in sin because we invite sin into our lives. We allow the devil into our lives. When we are tempted, we give in to that temptation. We made a choice to follow after the devil. But we have similar consequences, if you will. It it may not be a physical consequence, though it could be. But we have pain and we have suffering. When we are caught up in anger and jealousy, when we have addictions or we have materialism, perhaps we're filled with pride and deceit. See, that's destroying our soul. That's hurting us. That's putting, if you will, bruises and cuts and, and things like that on our souls. And so when we enter into sin, we're facing suffering as the devil is trying to destroy us. Now, how desperate is God for us to be delivered from that pain and suffering when we are in sin? You know, when he looks down upon us, he's troubled when we are thrashed about by the devil. And God in that condition can't have companionship with us. He can't have fellowship with us because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And he cannot have fellowship with sin. So we understand the Lord earnestly desires for us to be cured, earnestly desires for us to be healed. And when we are healed, he rejoices. So the question is, how desperate are you to get out of sin? How desperate are for you for your family to be delivered from sin. Romans 1.16, the Apostle Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. If we want to be delivered from sin, we've got to turn to the Word of God to see what it says as far as how we are delivered from sin. And essentially what it tells us, as is quoted in Mark 16, 16, or in Acts 2, 38, when Jesus is speaking in Mark 16, or when the Apostle Peter is speaking in Acts 2, 38, we have to believe Jesus is the Christ, we have to repent of our sins, and we have to be baptized to have our sins taken away, to be delivered from that sin. When we do that, the Father rejoices 
and we have a relationship with him. We have companionship with him. We have fellowship with him because we've been freed from that sin. And if we can help you to be delivered from sin, if you recognize your condition and you want to be delivered, no longer facing that sorrow and that suffering, then please contact us and let us know. We're ready to help you in any way we can. There are some things in God's Word that are hard to understand. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 to 18, the Apostle Peter acknowledges that there are things hard to understand. But that doesn't mean they're impossible to understand. In Ephesians chapter 5, And verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes this, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So something that's hard to understand is not impossible to understand. And we are told that we are to understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, we need to apply ourselves to studying the Word of God that we may understand what God teaches. We have to be careful as we study, not to twist it to our own destruction, as Peter talks about over there in Second Peter chapter 3, but we are to grow in knowledge. We are to increase our knowledge in the Word of God. Now, here's something we want to notice is, while there are some things that are hard to understand, there are some things that are easier to understand or should be easier. They're, they're basic or they're fundamental to the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 beginning, it says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So the writer of Hebrews here lays out for us this idea that there are things that are basic or elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, and included in those are repentance and faith and doctrine of baptisms. And that's what we want to focus on in this study is looking at the doctrines of baptisms and how this is an elementary teaching the Word of God. And what we're going to notice is four different types of baptism outlined in the New Testament. We're going to notice John's baptism. We're going to notice baptism of fire, the Holy Spirit baptism, and Christ's baptism. Now, it's important for us to note that there are different types of baptisms in the New Testament. And because there are different types, it's a mistake to lump them all together or to try to combine them together, to try to put them together and to get them confused about their purpose, about who they are for, If we do that, then we end up with a misunderstanding of the Word of God, and we end up misapplying it in our lives. We'll try to apply a baptism to ourselves that doesn't apply, or we'll try to apply it to other people to whom it does not apply. So let's begin now looking at these four different types of baptism in the New Testament in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Here in Acts chapter 19, the Apostle Paul is at Ephesus. <clears throat> and as he's at Ephesus here, he's teaching people and he runs into a particular group of people. And notice in Acts chapter 19, verse 3, what he says here. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. And that is speaking of Jesus' cousin, John, as he's sometimes called the Baptist, and that's not, by the way, not capital B Baptist, but small b. He, it, what it means is John the Baptizer. And this is John's baptism. He was known for baptizing people. And so he became known as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. And let's notice a little bit about the baptism of John. In John chapter 3, this is the Apostle John who wrote the book of John, of course. In John chapter 3, verse 23, this is what it says about John's baptism. Now, John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. So, John's baptism was characterized by much water. That's 
obviously because he immersed people. So that was John's baptism using much water. But what about the reason for his baptism? Why was he baptizing people? What was the point? What was the purpose to it? Well, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, leading unto the remission of sins. And it was leading unto it in this sense. It was leading people to Christ. He, remember in his teaching, was pointing to Christ. In John chapter 1, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he has seen and he has testified that Jesus is the Christ. So he was pointing people to Jesus. Because before Jesus died, sins could not be forgiven. They could not really be taken away. So when it talks about John's baptism being a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, that means it was pointing forward to people being forgiven in Jesus Christ. But it was a baptism in water. It was one of repentance leading unto the remission of sins, their sins being forgiven in Christ eventually. And it was something that indicated that men were obedient to God. Remember in Luke chapter 7, Luke 7, 29 and 30, it makes this statement here. It says, when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves and not having been baptized by him. So those who respected God listened to John and they submitted to the baptism that he was teaching because he was a representative or a prophet of God. Those who did not respect God, those who rejected the will of God, refused that baptism. Now, that baptism was for those people in that time, in that day. After Jesus was raised from the dead, After the day of Pentecost, when the apostles preached the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness, after that time, John's baptism was of no value, was of no, was not authorized any longer. It wasn't valid any longer. Again, we go back to Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, and when Paul found disciples there and he asked them, you know, did you receive the Holy Spirit? We have not so much as heard as the Holy Spirit. In verse 3, he says, then, to, then what were you baptized? So they said into John's baptism. Now, here's the key, verse 4. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. Do you see what happened here? That they had been baptized in John's baptism, but then they heard the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they had to be baptized in the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of lessons that could be learned in there, but here's the point. John's baptism was valid during John's ministry and John's teaching up to the point that the gospel was established and began to be preached from Pentecost forward. So John's baptism was valid for a short period of time. And after that, it wasn't valid any longer. So you and I are not under John's baptism. In other words, we we have no obligation to be baptized in John's baptism. So that's a very important thing to think about. Now, something else that John mentioned would come about, would happen, is the baptism of fire. If you go to Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, there's a lot of confusion out there in the world about this, but in Matthew chapter 3, notice verses 7 through 9 here. It says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, 
who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but He who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather up wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He's going to baptize with fire. Now, what's he talking about there? Really, what he's talking about in the context is Jesus is going to bring judgment. Here are these Pharisees and the Sadducees who are puffed up in their religious beliefs and hold on to the traditions of men who reject the will of God, as we've already talked about. He says, Jesus is going to come and he's going to judge you for what you have done, for your beliefs, your practices, for rejecting the will of God. He's going to cast those sinners into fire. There's going to be that baptism of fire, if you will. So that is the really the baptism of fire. But then he also mentioned here, as we read, that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's understand this was a promise of Jesus and something that Jesus would do. If you go to Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, notice what the Lord says here. In Acts 1 verses 4 through 8. He says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth." Do you see that? Jesus is telling the disciples that they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he's the one who promised it, and it is the apostles who received it. Look in Acts chapter 2. Remember Acts chapter 2 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were gathered, or they were with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And as you read on down through here, it's talking about the apostles being filled with the Holy Spirit and teaching to the people who are there the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they taught in the languages of the people who had gathered there from all nations under heaven. Now, here's the thing that we want to get at. Jesus was going to baptize with Holy Spirit, as John said in Matthew chapter 3. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. They were to wait in Jerusalem. In Acts 2, we see the fulfillment of that. So, these apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit. One other case of Holy Spirit baptism is recorded in the New Testament, and that's in Acts chapter 10. Notice in Acts 10, verse 44 and following here, where it describes the household of Cornelius being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, Acts 10, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, and as many as came with Peter because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. 
So you have them being baptized in the Holy Spirit and then baptized in water. And we'll make note of that again in just a moment. But look down in Acts chapter 11. Acts 11 verse 15. It says, as they began, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. This is Peter defending his actions at Cornelius' household because Cornelius was a Gentile. And he's having to explain to his Jewish brethren, here's why I went into him and here's what happened. And he's explaining the Holy Spirit fell upon that household as on us at the beginning. The beginning when? Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, when the gospel was first preached, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. And notice Acts 11 now, verse 16. Peter had said, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as it did upon us at the beginning, or as he did upon us at the beginning. Verse 16, Acts 11. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Do you see what he's saying here? He's saying the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning, verse 15, verse 16. Then I remembered what John said about Jesus baptizing and John indeed baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that's what Jesus promised them. God gave them the same gift. What gift? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. So baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 on the apostles and in Acts 10 on the household of Cornelius. And those are the only two instances that we have in the word of God of Holy Spirit baptism because it was only for those groups, because it was when the gospel was first preached to the Jews, Acts 2, and when the gospel was first preached to the Gentiles in Acts 10. It was to show God's approval of the events that were unfolding, God's seal of approval on the gospel being preached, that it is his word, it is his will, that he was calling men to believe and to follow in their lives. Now, again, Let's understand, in Acts 10, where we have the record of Cornelius' household being baptized in the Holy Spirit, it is separate and distinct from baptism of water because the Holy Spirit came upon them. And that's when Peter said, again, in Acts chapter 10, verse 47, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized? And he commanded them, verse 48, to be baptized in water. So those are two different baptisms. And it is that baptism, the water baptism, that Peter commanded them that you and I want to pay special attention to. In Matthew chapter 28, Matthew 28, when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he gave this command to his apostles before he went back into heaven. In Acts 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." So Jesus says, you go and you make disciples of the nations and you do this by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mark records it as, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Well, how is it that this is done? Notice Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. It gives us an indication of the nature of baptism, the mode of baptism as it's sometimes described. In Colossians 2 verse 11, it says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. You see, baptism that Jesus commanded is a burial, that is a submersion in water. 
for the people who believe, for the people who have repented, for the people who are willing to confess the name of Jesus Christ, and it is for the remission of sins. Remember in Acts chapter 2, Acts 2, we go back to that original day of Pentecost when the gospel was first preached. The apostle Peter preaches about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, how it was a fulfillment of prophecy, how Jesus confirmed what he taught with miracles. In Acts 2 verse 37, it says, when they heard that Jesus was the Christ, they were cut to the heart and asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So what's the answer? Acts 2.38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it is that they were told on that day that if you want to be right with God, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You see, the gospel of Christ is designed to lead men to salvation. And to lead them to salvation, they not only need to believe, but they have to repent of their sins and they have to be baptized, immersed in water. They're buried with Christ and they rise up to walk in newness of life, as Romans chapter 6 talks about. And there is only one baptism today. Let's understand that. You know, we've looked at different types of baptisms in the New Testament, but there's only one baptism that remains effective, and we want to show you where it says that in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 4, it says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, let's tie a couple of things together here. One Lord, right? There's only one. There's only one Spirit. There's only one God and Father. So just as much as there is only one Lord, there's only one baptism. There are not two Lords, there are not three Lords, there are not four Lords. There are not two spirits or three spirits or four spirits. There are not two fathers, three fathers, four fathers. There's not two baptisms today. There's not three baptisms. There's only one, one baptism. And as, we, as we've already seen, it's not John's baptism. That wasn't valid after Pentecost. It's not the baptism of fire. It's a baptism of fire is really just a, an illustration of Jesus bringing judgment on men. It's not Holy Spirit baptism because that was for the apostles, and it was for the household of Cornelius when the gospel was first preached to these different groups. It's only the baptism of Christ, water baptism, for the remission of sins. So, you understand that these are, are things that are taught in the New Testament. These, these baptisms are taught but we need to make sure we rightly divide this. We need to make sure we have an understanding of these fundamental teachings because we want to know how to properly apply the Word of God in our life so that we will have fellowship with God. So, I encourage you, study the Word of God. Search it for yourself. If you have questions about this, please let us know. Ask your question. We'll be happy to answer that question. And maybe even on a future episode, we will be happy to answer your question regarding these things, specifically regarding baptism and what the New Testament teaches about it. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord, thou my great Father and I thy true Son, thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Be thou my buckler, my sword for the fight, be thou my dignity, thou my delight, thou my soul shelter and
Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Are you looking for a church? Well, what are you looking for? One of the things we want to think about is the fact that man is a religious being. This is the way God has created man. In Acts chapter 17, verse 22, when the Apostle Paul is preaching to the people at Athens, he says this, as he was stirred up, seeing that the whole city was given to idolatry, he said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. That is, they were seeking to worship something greater than themselves. As you jump down to verse 27, the apostle acknowledges this is how God has made the world. He has set all these things up, verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us." Yes, people seek the Lord, but they very often seek the Lord in the wrong way. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, Paul acknowledges there that in ancient times, men went into idolatry because they pushed the true God out of their mind. And yet, because we are made to seek something greater than ourselves, we are made to be religious, that these men created idols. They created idols things that they would worship of their own mind, of their own desires, instead of following God's way. And Jesus had warned about this and had told about this in Matthew chapter 7, that there is a right way, there's a wrong way, there is a broad way and a narrow way. In Matthew 7, verse 13, remember, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So, most people go the way of error. They follow after their own desires instead of conforming to God's standard, instead of seeking what pleases God and accepting that and submitting to that in their lives. And so these other passages we've already looked at in Acts 17 and Romans chapter 1 tells us that the ancient world was like that. Well, it's no different in the modern world, even in our society where we have a religious Um, heritage and a heritage that says there is one true God and the Savior is Jesus Christ. Even in our culture, let's understand that the majority of people do not follow after the narrow way, but they go the broad way. They follow their own desires. So, when we ask you the question about looking for a church and are you looking for a church, it has to come up, well, What basis, on what basis are you seeking a church? What's the standard that you're using? And this is a very important question because when you think about being a part of a church, it involves our association and participation. And we're influenced in these associations and in this participation, the practices that we might be involved in. So, When we are a part of a church, it's going to affect our lives. It's going to affect our attitude. It's going to affect our beliefs, our conviction, our faith. It's going to affect our knowledge, what we understand to be true and right, what we understand to be error. And with all these things put together, let's understand it will affect our destiny. And so we need to be very careful about the group 
the church of which we would be a part, of which we would seek to associate and to attach ourselves to, because it has a profound impact on our life here, and it will have an impact on our life when the Lord returns, that is, eternity and how we will spend eternity. So let's think about this for a few minutes and open up our Bibles and study in the Word of God and begin by looking at wrong reasons. What are some wrong reasons to be a part of a particular church or a particular congregation? So let's think, first of all, as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, that a wrong reason is to base our decisions solely on the preacher. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, remember the context here. Paul is dealing with problems at Corinth and how that the various people there were dividing themselves up after Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Peter. In other words, there were different teachers that they were lining themselves up after. And it's not that Paul, Apollos, or Cephas were really doing this or anything. More likely, it was false teachers there. And Paul was talking about, you're dividing yourself up after men, and you should not be doing that. You should not be following after these personalities. In 1 Corinthians 4, then, verse 6, this is what he says. He's transferring what he's been talking to himself and Apollos. He says, now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. Now, here's the key, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So, he's telling them, as I'm illustrating the problem here, and I'm putting myself and Apollos in these positions, like you're lining yourselves up after us, like we are getting these crowds and, and these groups that are following us, he says that you may learn not to think beyond what is written. In other words, don't elevate men beyond what the Word of God teaches. Paul's true emphasis throughout this section of Scripture is follow Christ. Don't follow after men. Don't line up after those personalities because a man may be eloquent, because he may be well-educated, because he may be very warm and inviting and easy to talk to, because he comes across as compassionate and caring. That's not a reason, really, to be a part of a church. Now, should someone be kind and consider it? Yes, absolutely. Is it good to have someone who's able to speak the Scripture clearly? Yes, that is good. Is it good to have someone who teaches who's very knowledgeable in the Word of God? Yes, that is very good. But those should not be the reason that we become a part of a particular congregation. In other words, we shouldn't divide up after men. We shouldn't become followers of men and base our decision upon a particular man or a particular personality. Also, we shouldn't base our decision on family. You know, a lot of people, they end up becoming a part of a particular church or religious organization because that's what their family has done. But in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said this, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, Jesus is saying we have to put him ahead of our family. We have to make sure that we love the Lord more than we love anyone else on this earth. And for some people, that's a really hard thing to do. And we can understand that because our family has loved us. Our mother and our father has cared for us, has raised us, has provided us with the things that we need. They have blessed us in many ways in our life, and we can't discount that. And the Bible does teach, indeed, that we are to honor our father and mother. But the Lord draws a clear line. You have to put him before your family in honor all situations, at all times, the Lord comes first. You know, our family may be wrong. Our family may be an error. As many people in the first century were in that situation, that their family was caught up in Judaism, 
and they wouldn't leave it and become disciples of Christ, or maybe their family was caught up in idolatry and their family wouldn't leave that idolatry, but they would hear the gospel and recognize, well, Jesus is the Christ and idolatry is heir. Jesus is the Christ. I need to leave the religion of Moses and become a disciple of Jesus of Nazareth. You see, those people had to make a decision. Do I put my family and the family tradition first or do I put my Lord and Savior first? So there were hard decisions to make, but it gets to that point that we shouldn't make our decision on what church or what religion or what religious group to associate with because of family. The blood of Christ is a stronger bond and is more important than the blood that is in our veins, than our relatives, if you will. But then also, let's think about this. We shouldn't base a decision to be a part of a church or religious organization or a religious group because a whole lot of other people have decided to do that. Remember in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2, Moses said this, and this is a principle that we get out of here. In Exodus 23 verse 2, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. You shouldn't follow a crowd to do evil. Just because other people are doing it doesn't make it right. Just because a, because a lot of other people are doing it doesn't make it right. If there are a billion people following a particular way, that doesn't make that way right. You think about there's a billion Buddhists or more in this world. There's a billion Hindus or so. So, you know, just because a lot of people are following a particular thing or associated with a particular group doesn't mean that it's right. Again, we go back to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus, again, when he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, tells us that there is a narrow way, and that is the way we are to follow, and there is a wide way, a broad way that leads to destruction. The narrow way leads to life. The broad way leads to destruction. There are very few people who follow the religion of Jesus Christ, as is outlined in the Word of God. Many people follow religious groups or are part of religious groups and religious teachings that are sort of like what's in the Bible or mention things that are in the Bible. And they have pieces and parts of it, but they don't follow it fully in their life. You see, there's a broad way and there's a narrow way. And so we shouldn't base our decision of what group to be a part of because a whole lot of other people are doing it or following that way. And we shouldn't base our decision on material desires. There are some people who follow religious group or religious teaching because that religious group offer something to them in the way of material things. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, the Lord rebukes a church here, the Laodiceans, because they are caught up in material considerations. In Revelation 3, verse 15, he says, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. You see, these people were caught up in material things. They pursued the, the silver, the gold, and all these nice things. But he says, you're miserable, you're poor, you're naked, you're blind. You know, there are people who think church is about business connections, about a social connection. Well, how can I enhance my business life? How can I make more connections and expand my network? How can I expand my influence in the community? And so they'll, they'll choose a, a church based on those reasons. Others will base it on the idea that, 
they want to be entertained or they want some type of recreational outlet or some other material consideration. Maybe it is that that particular church is known for providing services to people. And so they're like, oh, I want to be a part of that. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, beginning, the Apostle Paul says this, therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, let's pause there for a second. Those at Corinth were gathering and they were attempting to observe the Lord's Supper. They were attempting to have communion, to partake of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. But he says, when you come together, that's not what you're doing. It's what you're trying to do, but it's not really what you're doing. Notice what he says, for in eating, each one of you takes his own supper ahead of others one is hungry and another is drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and to drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. You see, they had turned it into a meal. They had turned it into a social occasion. And the apostle Paul says, don't you have houses to eat and to drink in? You need to go home and eat your meals. And he says, when you do this, you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Do I praise you? No, he doesn't praise him. He's condemning them for this. Notice in verse 34, where he says this, but if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. So he's telling them, you know, church and the assembly of the church is not the occasion to take care of your physical and material needs. It's not the occasion to have your social meal. You need to be observing what God has commanded to be observed. So we shouldn't base our decision to be a part of a congregation or to look for a church on material things. It's not something that is a social club. It's not a place for our children to be entertained or anything like that. We need to base it on the things that God has commanded and what he lays out in the New Testament. And that's what we want to look at now. What are the right reasons? What are the good reasons? What is it that the word of God lays out for us? Well, first of all, let's look at Matthew 16, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Remember, Jesus had asked Peter and the other apostles about who men said that he was. And so Peter ends up confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is what the Lord said in Matthew 16, verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. See, the Lord promised to build his church. When we read on in the New Testament, we understand that he did indeed build his church. He established his church. Now, here's the key thing we want to understand. It's the Lord's church, and it's singular in nature. There are not many churches that the Lord established but only one church. Remember Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Jesus Christ built his church. He's the head of that church. And it says that that church is the body of Christ. And that's a simple enough concept. It's just two different ways of talking about the same organization. In one concept, it's the church. In another concept, it's the body. But it's speaking of the same thing. Now, in Ephesians 4, verse 4, it says this. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So he says the church is the body in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says there's one body. And that makes sense, right? There's one head and one body. And Jesus is that head and the body is the church. There's only one church. So when we go looking for a church, we want to be a part of that church that Jesus established. There's not many of those. There's only one. And so we want to look for a church 
that is what Jesus founded and in agreement with what his word teaches. Now, when we talk about looking for a local congregation, we want to join or associate with one that is established according to what the New Testament teaches. In Philippians chapter 1, it's very interesting how Paul begins this letter and addresses the church at Philippi. And in this address to them, in this opening remark to that church, he notes how that that church is organized. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. You see, the bishops there is what also is referred to as elders or shepherds or pastors is another word for shepherd, but they have bishops, plural, and deacons. Deacons is simply the idea of servants, a servant who is appointed to a specific task within a church. So, you have these men who are established as leaders in a local congregation. They're bishops, they're deacons, they're overseers, sometimes, or bishops and shepherds, rather. Overseers, they're sometimes referred to. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter 5, he says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I am who a fellow elder. He says, verse 2, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. So here's the idea. A local congregation in the New Testament was established properly when it had bishops, who are also called shepherds or pastors or called elders, overseers of that congregation, and they oversaw that congregation, that local church. So they were independent. They were autonomous. They were self-governing under the authority of Christ. So you have bishops and deacons. So when you look for a church, look for one that has elders or bishops as they are also termed, and deacons that are there. Now, sometimes there are men who are not qualified to meet that condition. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, it lays out qualifications for elders and for deacons. And sometimes a congregation doesn't have a multiplicity of men who are qualified for that. So, sometimes that may be lacking, but look for that and look for ones who believe in that, who teach that, who uphold that, and look for a church that's going to uphold the truth, one that is really determined that we're going to believe and follow and practice and teach and defend the doctrine of Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You see, each congregation is to uphold God's word, not compromise with society, not apologize and be ashamed of the truth, but uphold that truth because it is that truth that is going to save. Remember what Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So a congregation needs to uphold that to help men to be free from their sins. And you need to look for a church that is going to draw lines, a church that has a standard, and as we mentioned just a moment ago, it's not going to compromise that standard. A church that is discriminating, if you will, in who is accepted and who is not accepted. Now, it's not discrimination based on their ethnicity, the color of their skin, their nationality, whether they are male or female, rich or poor. It's not that type of thing, but it's discerning in is somebody committed to the Lord and truly a disciple, or is someone following after the ways of the world? That's the line of difference. That's the discernment that they are to use. And they need to make sure that the membership is faithful and true to the Lord. This is what happened in Acts, Acts chapter 9 when Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem and be a part of the church there. In Acts 9 verse 26 beginning, <clears throat> 
It says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. So they were determining, is Paul really a faithful disciple of the Lord or not? Now, Barnabas vouched for him, so they accepted Paul. So you need to look for a church that's going to draw lines to make sure that those who are part of that church are living a faithful and true life to the Lord. But we also need to understand that we want to look for a church that is worshiping in spirit and in truth. And we'll just look at one passage briefly at this in John chapter 4, 23 and 24. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. When you're looking for a church, you need to see that that church is doing what the New Testament says as far as worship. Are they singing? Are they teaching the Word of God? Are they praying? Are they taking up a collection on the first day of the week and observing the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? Because that's what the New Testament lays out, and that's for another lesson to get into more details on those things. But are they worshiping in spirit and in truth? Do they have the spirit but not the truth? That's a problem. Do they have the truth but not the spirit? That's a problem. You want to look for one that worships in spirit and in truth. So as we think about this, if you're looking for a church, you're looking for a group or an organization that's going to help you to get to heaven. It will affect your destiny. It's going to affect your attitude. It's going to affect your faith. It's going to affect your knowledge. And so you want to be careful and discerning to look for one that is in agreement with the Word of God. And so if you have any more questions about that, please contact us and let us know. We'll be happy to study this out with you to help you find a church that is pleasing to God and is going to be a benefit and a blessing to your soul. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to go to our Facebook page and leave a comment or question about this episode. Our members are ready to assist you with any questions and will work to share a Bible answer with you. The web address for our Facebook page is facebook.com slash word and sword. That's facebook.com slash word and sword. Or you can simply go to Facebook and search Word and Sword TV program. Thank you for watching this Bible study program brought to you by the Newton, North Carolina Church of Christ. If you do not live in the area but want to connect with a local group of Christians striving to follow the New Testament alone, then please contact us. While we are non-denominational and each congregation is independent, We have many personal contacts across the country and even around the world with which we can put you in touch. So just contact us and we will assist you in connecting with a local group of Christians. You can email us at contact at wordandsword.com. You can call us at 828-465-3009. That's 828-465-3009. Or post a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash word and sword. It's time to answer a couple of your questions. First of all, from David C. He says, please comment on Luke 9, 49 and 50 and give the meaning of it. So in Luke 9, 49 and 50, it says, now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Now, there's something key in this passage, and that's the idea that he says he's casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And then the Lord responds and says he is on our side. 
That's the idea that he's acting under the authority of Christ. If you keep reading and go down into the chapter 10, we see that Jesus had more than the 12 apostles who were his disciples who were following him and going out and acting on his authority. In fact, it tells us there that there were 70 who were sent out. We know the the number of people following Jesus was even larger than that. So the idea is if someone is acting under the authority of Christ, even though they may not be directly involved with us and doing exactly what we are doing, they are still in harmony with us because they're acting under the same authority as we are acting under. But let's also be mindful that not everyone who says that they are acting under the authority of Christ actually are doing the will of of God. In Matthew chapter 7, remember here in verses 21 to 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness." So there were people doing things who were very zealous, as a matter of fact, in doing something in the name of Christ. But Jesus says, you're not doing it according to the will of my Father in heaven, and therefore you are lawless. You're outside my law or my will. Now, how do we know the difference between someone who says they are acting in the name of Christ and are actually under the authority of Christ? And those who say they're doing something in the name of the Lord and they're outside of his will, they are lawless. Well, there's a very good example of this in Acts chapter 17. That is the example of how to know the difference. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul goes from Thessalonica to Berea. And in verse 11, it says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Now, think about what's happening here. The apostle Paul is preaching to these people, and they're testing what he says by the word of God. And that's exactly what we need to do today, that when people come to us and they proclaim they're doing something in the name of the Lord, we need to go back to that standard that God has revealed and compare what they say, what they do to that standard. If they are following it, they're acting by the authority of God and we should encourage them. We should accept what they do, what they say. But if they're not doing it by the authority of God, they're not following his will as revealed in the Bible, then we need to reject those people and we need to See if there's an opportunity even to try to teach them, to enlighten them, to help them to better understand the will of God. But that's what we need to do. We need to accept those who are acting by the authority of the Lord and reject those in the teaching that they may bring uh, who are not acting by the authority of the Lord. Now, next question comes from Tanya G. She says, what is wrong to be, or why is it wrong to be homosexual? Well, that's very similar if we ask the question, why is it wrong to be an adulterer? Why is it wrong to be a drunkard? Well, the reason these things are wrong is because God has declared them to be wrong. They are sin. And a couple of passages we'll turn to relative to this is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, And then we'll also look at Romans chapter 1. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 
So he says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And then he lists specific things that fall under that category of unrighteousness. And among those, he says there are adulterers. So we might ask that question again, what is wrong with being an adulterer? Because he goes on to list homosexuals and sodomites. So what's wrong with being a homosexual? What's wrong with being a sodomite? It's unrighteousness. It's contrary to the will of God. And people who practice those things are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul says something very similar over in Romans chapter 1 and verse 24 beginning. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, his blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So the Bible clearly says that homosexuality is a sin, just like adultery is a sin, being a drunkard is a sin, being an idolater is a sin. And that's all that we need to understand when it comes to this question, why is it wrong to be a homosexual? It's wrong because it's wrong to commit sin. We have to abide by the will of God. Now, your idea of what is acceptable and my idea of what is acceptable may conflict with what God says is acceptable. As a matter of fact, society is very often in conflict with God and contradicts God. You think about all the things in times past in different societies at different times that have been acceptable and they've been approved by society in general. Even the murder and genocide of human beings has been approved, but that didn't make it right just because an entire society or entire country agreed that it was okay and practiced that. In our society, approving of homosexuality or drunkenness or adultery, that doesn't make these things right and acceptable. And we need to resist that influence and stand firm in what the Word of God says. So we need to make a clear distinction between what is right and wrong. And we need to stand for that and not be ashamed of it, but to help others who are doing what is wrong to leave that sin so that they may be right in the sight of God. So thank you for your questions. If you have a question, please submit that call in or submit it on the Facebook page or send us an email. And we will do our very best to answer that with the Word of God as the authority to answer that question. Or we might also include that in a future episode. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828 465 Three zero zero nine. Did you know rapture is not in the Bible? You can take your Bible app or software program and do a search for the word rapture in the Bible, Old or New Testament, and you'll come up with zero results. Rapture is a part of a larger doctrine of premillennialism. It's a doctrine that's not found in the Bible, but it's a misinterpretation of what the Bible teaches. And so, when you think about that, you have to wonder, why would somebody teach the rapture? And where does it come from? And what does that mean about my understanding and conviction about God and His plan of salvation and particularly what the future holds? So, we ask the question, what is the rapture? Well, it's commonly defined in this way or described in this way, if you will, that Christ will return to the earth, but it's an invisible return at some point in the future, and that all the faithful will suddenly be gone. 
that they're there one minute and they're gone the next. And that's what people consider as the rapture or people will be raptured, if you will. And maybe you've seen those bumper stickers. They were really popular a few years back about uh, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. It's like somebody's driving down the highway and then poof, they're gone. And that car just keeps on trucking and th there's nobody driving it. So that's that's the concept. And the idea is that when they're raptured, they're going to be taken to heaven for a seven-year period, but the wicked will remain on earth. And during that seven years, there's going to be a tribulation on the earth. And that tribulation is for the purpose of turning people back to God, that they would repent and submit to God's will. Then at the end of that seven years, Christ will come again and bring all those that he had raptured originally. There will be this great battle of Armageddon and then a thousand year uh, kingdom of Christ reigning upon the earth. And there's a lot of other things involved in that, but that's, that's those things surrounding the rapture. Well, the tribulation and the rapture are based essentially, or they're discussed a lot, maybe we should say, on two passages from the New Testament. And when we think about the rapture, uh, it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where people go to and they, they look at this a lot about, here's what the rapture is, or this is describing the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4. And I want to quote from a book called Things to Come. And it's it's a book about uh, premillennialism, explaining, explaining premillennial doctrines and the variances of it that different people teach out there. But here, let's grab this essential uh, quote out of that book, Things to Come. The present age in respect to the church terminates with the translation of the church into the Lord's presence. Second quote, the doctrine of the translation of the church is one of the major considerations of eschatology of the New Testament. And then he cites 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18. So we want to read that. And let's see what these passages say, what these verses say, and then examine them in light of what's taught about the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, But I want you, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, first of all, let's understand that rapture is not mentioned in here, that that word is not used anywhere in here. But remember that the rapture is said to be something that will be silent, that the return of Christ will be invisible. And the people who are left on earth won't know what has happened. They just know that people who were here are now gone. Well, look at this again and notice what it says in verse 16, for instance, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of archangel, with the trumpet of God. It's telling us here when he returns, that it's going to be audible, that there's going to be the shout, this trumpet, this loud noise to call our attention to Christ. And he's going to return, the idea is, visibly. We're going to see him. But there are people who have this idea that Christ is going to come one time invisibly and come a second time invisibly, where the Bible just teaches, you know, Christ was here on earth about 2,000 years ago, and he's going to return just once, not twice, not once invisibly to rapture people, and then seven years later, visibly to come back and establish a kingdom. Nowhere in the Word of God does it teach that. But then let's notice this, that the resurrection, let's go to John chapter 5, John chapter 5, because with this rapture, 
And one of the ideas is you've got this resurrection of the just at the beginning and the resurrection of the unjust at the end. So there's seven or a thousand seven years between when they are the just are raised up and the wicked are raised up. So you've got the seven years of rapture, you have a thousand year reign of Christ, and then at the end of that, that's when the unjust are going to be raised from the dead. But notice what Jesus said about the resurrection in John 5, verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, again, the premillennial doctrine associated with the rapture says that the just are resurrected at the beginning of the rapture, when the rapture takes place, so they're taken off into heaven. They're there for seven years. They return with Christ. He establishes a kingdom, and then there's a thousand years that go by, and then the unjust are raised. So, a thousand seven years between resurrection of the just and resurrection of the unjust. But Jesus, as we just read, says, for the hour is coming. The hour, a very specific point in time in which all who are in the graves will come forth. And he says, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. They're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. Did you ever think about this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, that we're going to hear that voice, those who are in the graves, and be brought forth out of those graves? Because the Son of God's going to call to us, it's going to be that shout for us to come forth. The duration of the rapture is said to be seven years. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. It says that Christ is going to come back, verse 16, and the dead in Christ will be raised first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. You see, this doctrine of the rapture says that the righteous are going to be raised and the righteous who are living will be caught up with the Lord for seven years and then come back to the earth remain there a thousand years, at the end of the thousand years, they'll be caught up again with him to heaven and stay there forever. Where 1 Thessalonians 4, the apostle Paul writing, says when he returns, we'll hear him, we'll see him, that we're going to, the dead in Christ will be raised, those who are alive will be caught up with the Lord, and thus we shall always be with the Lord, not temporarily with the Lord, but always will be with the Lord. So, we understand that 1 Thessalonians 4 does not talk about the rapture. Well, what about that tribulation during the seven years of the rapture or that seven-year period when saints have been raptured and are in heaven and then come back? There's supposed to be this tribulation on earth. Well, that usually is based on Matthew chapter 24. So, let's go over to Matthew chapter 24. And let's just notice what the Lord says here. Let's let's pick up in verse 15 and read down through verse 21. So Matthew 24, 15 to 21. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So, let's think about this. The tribulation in the premillennial doctrine, dealing with post-rapture events, that this tribulation is supposed to be for the wicked who are left on earth. 
But who is it Jesus is addressing in Matthew 24? Matthew 24, verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. See, he's talking to his disciples. Verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. He's talking to the disciples. And in this case, it's the apostles. There would be some others there who are with them. But he's talking to disciples. He's talking to saints. He's not talking to and addressing wicked people in the future, but he's talking to his faithful followers and so he's saying, you are going to experience the tribulation. You are going to see when this happens. You are going to go through this and be hated and be mistreated and abused. But premillennialism says that the tribulation is for all the world. But that's not what Jesus talks about here. And did you see this? When you think about this, first of all, in the setup to this or the lead up to this, the disciples ask a question in verse 2. It says, "Do you?" Not, Jesus says to them, Do you not know all these things? Uh, see all these things? Or surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming into the end of the age? The disciples heard Jesus talking about the destruction of the temple. And they want to know when that's going to happen, what sign is going to indicate that that's going to happen, and what is the sign of the coming of the end of the age. So they think that the world will end when the temple is destroyed because that's how they viewed the temple. They couldn't imagine that the world would continue on after the destruction of that temple. So Jesus spends verses 1 to 35 answering the first two questions where they had asked, what, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming? Him coming in judgment. They understood that's what he was talking about. He would come in judgment. And they want to know when that's going to happen. So verses 1 to 35, that's what Jesus talks about. He says, you want to know the signs to the destruction of Jerusalem, when that's coming about, when that time is approaching. So he goes through this list of different things that they are to look for. If you look in the parallel in Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, notice what the Lord says here. Luke 21, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. You see that? The Lord says you're going to have these signs pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem when one stone will not be left upon another. And when you see those signs, you need to flee. You need to get out. You need to take action because I'm coming in judgment. Now, the Lord was coming in judgment against Jerusalem because they rejected him, because they had rejected the Christ and they had put him to death. And so the temple would be destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD and that obliterates Israel as a nation. They really never exist ever again because those genealogical tables were destroyed. And there's no way to reconstitute that Old Testament system of the priesthood and the tribes and all those things. So that was wiped out and destroyed again because of God's vengeance upon the children of Israel and their rejection of his son. And notice again that it is a local event. He says, those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When you see the Jerusalem surrounded by armies, so it's a local event and they are to flee. And it says there that be hope that you are not pregnant for the women or nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight would not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. What's that talking about? It's not a worldwide tribulation. But it's talking about a tribulation that's localized to Jerusalem and the surrounding area when the Romans would come to exact vengeance upon the nation of Israel. But then notice in verses 33, Matthew 24, 
33 to 35. And he says here, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. So you're going to see these signs. You know the destruction is near. Verse 34, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. He's talking about this generation. That's 2000 years ago, not our generation or a future one from us, but that generation, the apostles would see these things unfold. So it was long ago that this tribulation, these events that Jesus is talking about, unfolded and took place, and they are now a matter of history. But notice Jesus turns his attention to the end of the age in verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then he gives the illustration of the days of Noah, how that the flood came suddenly upon the people that they were living their lives, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And the floods then came down upon the world and destroyed it as God judged the world in ancient times. And so it is now. We understand Jesus talking about that day, the judgment day, the end of the world. There's not going to be any sign. There were signs leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem and the disciples and all the saints were to take action to avoid that suffering. But of that day, the judgment day, the return of Christ, no one knows. And there's not going to be any signs that are given. And there he talks about two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other will be left. Verses 40 and 41. And some people, again, point to that. They say, see, there's the rapture. Well, no, that's what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 was talking about, that as we are living upon this earth, Christ returns, that the dead in Christ will rise. Those who are faithful will be caught up with him in the air. And that means the wicked are going to remain here. That judgment's going to take place and will either be taken to heaven with Christ or we will be cast off into hell. One taken another left, not in the rapture, but it's talking about in the final judgment. And so reflect on this for just a moment. The word rapture is not in the Bible, and yet there's an entire doctrine built around that or its place within an entire doctrine of premillennialism. Tribulation, as it's taught by the premillennialist, is not in the word of God. And so you have to question the entire doctrine of a thousand year reign of Christ on earth that he intended to establish an earthly kingdom long ago, but he couldn't do it because the Jews reject him. You have to look at that and question everything about it because it's not something that could be found in the Bible. It's a misrepresentation and a misinterpretation of the Bible. So we commend these thoughts to you and invite you to ask us more questions about premillennialism or any other doctrine that doesn't make sense or is confusing in light of what the Word of God teaches. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word, I ever with thee and thou with me. sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, and thou my high tower.